Okay, uh, we are officially here. Welcome to the fourth or fifth annual Family of Eight convention. It's a feature people eagerly look forward to every year at BCF Midwest, where a few of us talk to a few of you about the things that we've been doing for a while. So, um, actually, we should introduce Mattis, who is here from Sweden. Um, and if you are on the VC forums or anything, you'll know him in both the eight forum, the HP stuff, um, does a lot of interesting things. And I don't know what you're going to talk about this morning, but <laughs> neither do you. So that's OK. Um, and then let's just start with Kyle and wow. talk about stuff. Or do you want me to talk about Malcolm's board first? I mean, we can go youngest oldest, that's fine. Yeah. Or you can talk about we're still going to start with Kyle. OK. <laughs> Go ahead. All right. Um, I'll start talking about uh, one of one of our reproduction boards here. This is a uh, single chip solution to a problem that many PDP8 owners uh, face, which is more peripherals. In this case, a serial port. This is a 128 microcell uh, CPLD that's still in production. It's five volt and as you can see, there's there's really not much on the board. This is the extender card, by the way. Uh, makes it much easier to get in and out of the bus. But the the CPLD is capable of driving the omnibus, which is rather impressive considering the there's many many debates on the forum about which bus drivers should be used to drive the omnibus. This is capable of a 60 milliamp per pin uh, syncing, which is more than sufficient for um, for the Omnibus. I think it was designed for PCI. Is that right, Alan? OK. Well, anyways, it's old, but it's still in production. It's based on the Altera Max 7000 family. Um, it turns out you can use Quartus tools to uh, synthesize both Verilog and VHDL to get a uh, uh, output file that can then be converted for the Atmel as long as you target 128 microcell or, or smaller part. Uh, anyways, we have found that essentially you get one, um, one omnibus board's worth of chips in the CPLD. So I think we're using close to 90% utilization to, this is a serial card. This is uh, exactly what is synthesized on on this part here. So, anyways, there there is another project out there that uh, uses a, a bus drivers and receivers with a smaller 3.3 volt CPLD. But this is a very attractive solution since it's one chip. So, anyways, uh, thank you to Alan right there for actually. Well, and, and Malcolm, but Alan did the board layout. Malcolm did the uh, couple, which is a terrible, terrible language. And anyone who uses it should be ashamed of themselves. But, uh, but it works. And I've got that uh, running in my PDP-8. Uh, took it out of the, the box just to, to bring it in here. So that is coupled with uh, some software I wrote that I talk about every time. So if you're tired of hearing me talk about it, I'm sorry. It's serial disk. It's uh, capable of emulating a, a disk drive over serial port. So this card is operating at 230.4 uh, KBOD, which is, for all intents and purposes, maybe about 90% the speed of a real RKO5. Not bad. Uh, any slower, it's very, very painful. So uh, yeah, I think that's all I got. Well, um, on this board, was this synthesized from Vince's drawing? Do you want to talk about that at all? Or? Oh, uh, I don't think this was synthesized from uh, Vince's drawing. So Vince is a, a masochist. He takes these very large omnibus boards and for fun uh, captures schematics of each and every one. And then, just to show you how much of a masochist he is, in Pearl, he has written a script to take all of the 7400 series logic and translate it to couple, which is then fed through the uh, synthesis tool and synthesizes uh, for the uh, 
ATF-1508 CPLD. Yeah. So uh, potentially this could be a very automated uh, process. You know, say you've got uh, RK-8E three-board set. Uh, once you have uh, schematics of all that, you can run it through the tool and then with a little little more schematic capture for uh, maybe a three CPLD uh, board. I did that for the serial board that's in your hand. Yeah. And, uh, but I did not, uh, not the code is more compact. Yeah. So that's the way it is. Yeah. So the, the synthesis tool is, is capable of maybe a few shortcuts and uh, maybe there's some wasted logic here or, or something to, to make it more efficient just doing it by hand. But uh, perhaps the, the Quartus 2 um, path and VHDL or Verilog might be a more efficient way in the future. So that's something that we have not played with much yet. I've just exercised the tool chain enough to know that it is possible to target an Atmel CPLD through Altera's software, which is which is slick. And actually, the serial code for that, or the uh, UART code for that board, the genesis of it was out here on a table two years ago when Malcolm and I sat down and I walked him through a rough outline of the UART and then Malcolm took it back to Australia to finish it. So it actually happened here at the show. Okay. Very cool. All right. Well, yeah, that's uh, that's what I got then. Okay. And the other piece, too, just to mention in passing, is when people worry about driver capacity for these chips, the kind of benchmark from DEC would be two full chassis with core memory. So we probably couldn't do that with these dri with the chips. We don't. Nobody knows. But you can sure do the kind of typical load that people will be putting in a box now, especially if, if you're using something like a 32K memory board that draws, what, 10 milliamps or something? Yeah, so. Yeah, we, we have this 32K board. The equivalent 32K of core would be 12 boards, taking up uh, half of an omnibus uh, chassis. Yeah, three three amps per. So much much more attractive, and look how much space we have for prototyping. Okay, thanks, um, Mattis. I'm just going to introduce you, and you can say as little or as much as yeah, you'd like. Okay. Yes, uh, Mattis Lind from yeah, sorry. Mattis Lind from Sweden. I have a small computer museum in Sweden with my father. Uh, www.datormuseum.se and uh, if you have any plans for go to Sweden, you can uh, contact us and have a visit. We have uh, a host of different vintage machines, PDP-8, Straight-8, uh, PDP-9, several PDP-11s, VAX, etc., HP machines. Uh, some of them are running, not everyone, but uh, the aim is to get as much running as possible. It takes time and resources, but uh, we're working on it slowly to get there. So welcome to Sweden and have a visit. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, and it is a fantastic place, and there's a lot running. Ah. So definitely worth the visit. Okay. So um, Mark Madlock was going to come today. He's not able to. And Oscar... Also didn't come Oscar Vermeulen, who did the Pi DP8. Uh, there's been rumors of a Pi DP11 for many years. And so just to prove that it's more than a rumor, here is a Pi DP11. Uh, it's running over there in the corner somewhere. Um, this is a, a beta that Mark's been working on. But I think, does anybody know if he's actually shipping boxes? I think a few and then yeah, other things. So this thing is ready to go, and it is trickling out slowly. So if you haven't ordered one, order one. Uh, the Pi DP8 has been incredible. I think he sold over 2,000 units. This is something that he thought might appeal to you know, 25 people or something. And it's really taken on a life of its own. It's curious to, to see how the 1170 will do. But it's a, a, a beautiful thing. It works the way it should. 
uh, it's running Ristis now uh, in the demo mode, and it's just a, it's just a cool machine. Um, the other person who's not here right now is uh, Malcolm McLeod, so I'm showing this for him. This is uh, this year's product from him. This will eventually have the equivalent of a couple of those guys on there. And uh, yeah, so he will have a 32K. This, the way this is set up, it's a, at least a three portion board. What's populated here is a bootloader, which actually has an uh, onboard Arduino. You know, the trend, the way everybody makes this stuff work is you just use smarter and smarter devices to emulate dumber and dumber stuff. <laughs> and um, what we're emulating at this point is the MI8E, which was a ROM board from DEC to bootload your operating system or other things when you start the PDP-8E or M or F, any of those guys. Does the, L does not have a, uh, well, it wouldn't work on, it's a, yeah, it's an omnibus machine. So um, on the MI8E, you have 32K, 32 words of diode memory. And that means to change the input, you sit there and you clip or solder diodes, which is a very instructive thing to do once. Uh, <laughs> and even more so because they're in backwards order and inverted. Um, by the time you're done, if you're not dyslexic when you start, you will be when you finish. <laughs> so what Malcolm has done is worked with the Arduino and put in the ability to load code into the Arduino and it'll react when the switch is flipped. The, again, if you don't know the uh, eight front panel, on the far left as you face it, there's a switch labeled SW for switch. And all that thing does is jam an instruction when you raise and lower it to jump to this board or to jump to the mi 80 Currently, this will handle, well, he's got three active switches, so he's got eight places to put code. This one is set up with a serial disk loader in it and also a short diagnostic. And it's not really clear how long, how much code you can get in there. Probably a full page, a 4K, uh, I mean, the, depending on the Arduino. The nano, the nano has 2K. But you could, uh, and yeah. You could theoretically, uh, that, that I believe is what you would run on yeah. first. So you could potentially load an image, not just a, a loader. Um, but like I say, right now we're just loading serial disk. Um, I think he has code for RX01, RK, a few other things, CAPS8. Uh, and also, again, it can run a demo, so uh, a diagnostic. So when we didn't know if this board was working correctly, even though I didn't have a console, we could use this and just run the accumulator test through the front panel lights. Uh, the reason it didn't work correctly was a human error, assuming I'm human, but it does work now and works very nicely. Room for a couple more CPLDs on there, so adding serial board function, adding 32K RAM, um, all going to happen pretty soon. Also, any of this stuff where people want to contribute, obviously, it's all open core, or open source, on on board on where was it? Online is the word. Um, and all Malcolm's code is there, everybody's code is out. Uh, the bootloaders really are pretty straightforward, so it's not a big deal to just enter that stuff and put it into the Arduino. And I think his code is relatively clean. We, we were confused, yeah, we were but, the, but the code was fine. Thing, yeah. Uh, yeah, we were able to modify it in pretty short order to add that little di diagnostic, so. Yeah. So that's that. Um, same thing, I think that there are just prototypes of this thing. Um, I expect he'll go into production with something with gold fingers pretty soon. And, but and, and probably uh, full length. So yeah, or combine it with something else. To, yeah, yeah because know. these are knuckle busters to get in and out of the chassis. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I think that's all I'm doing for Mark and Malcolm, and I'm not doing anything. I'm just holding boards up and talking. So, uh, Doug, say hello. Uh, hello, I'm Doug, and I'm a PDP holic <laughs> I'm not recovering. No, I have I have eight eights. Um, the oldest one I got from the School of Mines when they retired it. School of Mines and Technology in Rapid City, uh, South Dakota. 
I bought that in 85. So I was about the, well, I was the second owner and it's kind of a chore to keep running these days. You fix it and then it seems to run about six months and then you fix something else and the cycle repeats. Uh, I inherited an 8i project, which is just pieces at the moment. It was a, it probably was a working machine, uh, but it, it was transported to my house and, and then uh, um, transported, disassembled. So I've inventoried everything that's there. It, was, it wasn't my project, but uh, I guess it has become so now. And I think the goal of that one was to make an 8i that had every kind of disc that DEC ever made so you could do you know, media transport if somebody had a pack. Uh, I, I don't know if I have the, the, the guts to finish that. <laughs> it's, it's huge. Uh, I have a deck set 8,000, which is an 80 with a, a dark blue, light blue front panel and switches. And the only one I've ever seen is, is the one I have. Somebody sold it on eBay and it was miscategorized. So, uh, I'm not sure exactly how I saw it, but uh, popped up and I said, oh, I need that. <laughs> and then I have uh, four eight A's in various states of uh, operation. One works. So the, the two machines I have that work are a straight eight uh, built in 1967 and then uh, uh, the 8A, which was built, I think, in uh, 79. Uh, yeah. Uh, Collecting cards, Kyle's got my floating point car card set, which he verified works yesterday. We, we were able to run both both main decks and pass with flying colors. And uh, the other rare card I have is the 128K memory card the deck made, but I don't have the special MMI that goes with it to take advantage of that. And the reason I don't have one of those is because apparently there's 8As still in service that use that board, the pair of boards. Um, I believe it's a Genrad test set. So there's some places still using these things in, in service. Uh, that, that always amazes me. But the A's seem to be pretty bulletproof machines. Uh, I have a, quite a few cards. and. The only ones that seem to have any problems are the option one, option two cards occasionally have just strange things quit working. And, but all this stuff is still pretty readily available. And um, if you don't have one, you, you, should, you should get one. Doug, can you talk about your software project, the, uh, the insane software project oh, the, that you brought to Southeast? OK, yeah. Um, in 1976. I had an Altair that I built in my dorm room, but I didn't have enough money to buy memory. And a friend of mine had bought Mits Basic, um, but I couldn't run it. He couldn't run it. And so I had access to the, the school's eight, and over the summer I wrote an 8080 emulator that used the DF32s as backing stores. So I had a 64K 8080 running on a PDP-8, except that I had a bug. And it would have, I thought at the time it would have been easy if I could have gotten some of the 8080 diagnostics that must have been available, but you know, there was no such thing as the internet. Uh, and that project ended up um, kind of vanishing into the cracks. Uh, last year, we were cataloging my deck tapes and found the source code. And then about a month later, a friend of mine sent me a, a little box of paper tapes, and I had given him a paper tape of the source. It's about this, th this tall. And so I had two copies of this, and I, and I decided, well, I have to get this going. Um, downloaded diagnostics, and much to my amazement, it passed everything. So I had some other kind of bug that... Um, that didn't show up in any of the diagnostics. And after uh, probably a couple hundred hours of, of writing my own tests, buying eight different 8080s and generating um, output from all of these things, I discovered that there are really eight different 8080s that all produce different results when you run <laughs> test programs on them. And none of that helped. <laughs> 
What turned out to be the problem was in Microsoft Basic, one of the eight instructions, um, one of the 8080 instructions would execute and leave the, uh, the PDP-8 carry bit set, the link bit set. And that would get migrated in as a set link bit at the start of the rotate accumulator left instruction instead of being cleared like it was supposed to. So I ended up fixing a 40-year-old bug that was uh, by changing an RAL to a CLL RAL. Just one instruction. One, it, it's just one bit, in fact. So uh, now I have a 8080. And then, of course, I had to speed it up. My DF32s don't work. Well, I'm not willing to, to risk them. Uh, so I changed the, the way it worked. I'm running it on the 8A. I emulate uh, 48K of 8-bit memory, and it runs about 1 60th of the speed of an 8080. So it's, it's almost, almost usable. So yeah, that's my insane project. Uh, the next phase of that is to, um, to implement the CPM BIOS in PDP-8 code so that it at least isn't emulated at the 8080 level. So yeah, that's... That's pretty stupid, actually. <laughs> but it's a fun project, and it keeps me off the streets. Um, what, and do you have manuals you have still? Oh, yeah, I have a table of, of old data books and manuals. Um, if, if you need something, um, you know, it's like most of them are 1985 and older. Uh, just come on over. Find what you need and make a donation or not. It's up to you. But I want these to go to a good home. Okay? Thank you. I'm Vince Slingstad. Uh, some of you probably knew that. But anyway, uh, uh, I guess my claim to fame is that I maintain the website so much stuff.com and it is full of all things that I have been able to locate that are PDP 8. So uh, there are collections of PDP 8 software, collections of PDP 8 documentation. I do quite a bit of work. Uh, creating, recreating, whatever the right word is, the CAD drawings and the documentation for these modules that uh, the older PDP-8s are made of. Uh, when people twist my arm, I work on the large, uh, larger boards. Those are, those are quite a chore to uh, reverse engineer. Uh, these, uh, one of these you can do in, well, I can do in a couple of hours. Uh, one of these maybe in an afternoon. Uh, one of those in a week, sometimes a week and a half. Uh, the, the hex cards uh, for the 8A, uh, I would estimate a month just because uh, the more you make them bigger, the more stuff there is, the finer the traces, the more... Uh, the more chips, the, more, the higher uh, level of integration. One of the uh, one of the issues with doing the memory controller that uh, that Doug is looking for is that at that point they began to use programmable logic to create what are essentially gate arrays or PALs, uh, although they're often implemented as ROMs. But uh, then you've got the question of well, what is this block supposed to do? And how am I supposed to recreate the logic equations for that mess? And uh, so anyway, uh, that's the sort of thing that I am known for. Recently, what I've been working on is uh, a friend of ours uh, passed away uh, last year. I think we might, did we mention it? Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, he had done uh, some work with the Rhode Island Computer Museum uh, on the restoration of their uh, PDP-8s and PDP-12s, and he had designed a uh, flip chip tester, which tests these modules. Um, and 
uh, we had his, uh, you had his boards, uh, and, and I had photographs of them and so forth. So I did the reverse engineering of that, and uh, I don't know if we ever actually found schematics or whether it was some, but, but I remember it at any rate it being mostly a reverse engineering thing. Um, uh, anyway, I reverse engineered it, uh, made some printed circuit boards. Uh, so a few people have uh, flip chip testers now. Uh, and uh, most recently, uh, been th uh, getting another friend of mine to 3D print these boxes and putting Raspberry Pi zeros in there. And uh, then you don't need to have a DOS PC or laptop to hang off the side, which the original would have needed. Uh, and uh, so over on the table, we have uh, one of these that actually works. This one does not. Um, uh, sitting there being tested repeatedly. And uh, Warren also did some amazing work uh, because not only do you need the sort of electrical engineering here, but you also need to create the actual test vectors and uh, whatnot. Uh, to be able to exercise the card and then to be able to diagnose what the heck does it mean that this bit is wrong. And so, uh, and that it has consumed me lately, I, th I think. I have very little progress on any of my other fronts, so. How many tests are in place? How many uh, tests are available? Uh, Um, but I would guesstimate 50, maybe, something like that. I would have said 40, 40 to 50. Yeah. And, and based on the population, on the selection of cards used in the 8i, that would cover probably 80% of them? Uh, well, it depends on how you measure the, the coverage. Uh, the, the PDP-8s themselves, they use the popular modules quite a bit and most of the popular modules are testable. So you'd get, in that sense, fairly decent coverage. In terms of if you just enumerate and say there are, whatever there are, say 23 different kinds of module in a, PDP, in a given model of the PDP-8, and then you might find that only 10 of them are testable. Things that you can't test are, you know, a lot of the green handle cards for the memory. Um, Analog stuff, orange. Analog, yeah, yeah, yeah. What it, what you need is you need a purple handle, uh, which means it's positive logic, and it needs to be logic. So, you know, if it is an interface card to something else, you're not going to be able to test that because there's a there's a part of that that is not positive logic. That that's not to say you can't exercise some of them, but correct. But verifying but, full functionality would be difficult. For instance, I'm sure. The uh, teletype interface could be exercised, right? You could you could write a test case that would output things to the teletype. Sure, you could do that. But, uh, but whether it was that. working or not, the tester could not tell you. Right. Yeah, it's it's the maroon cards from the I, the L, the twelve, and vectors could be written to do some of the omnibus cards. You could put two of these side by side, and well, the maroon cards are also. Uh, yeah common in uh, early, early 11 gear, stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, right, right. Um, Warren was working on a, a version 2 that could test uh, all cards. I mean, uh, uh, he was going to do A to Ds and D to As and measure slew rates and uh, uh, programmable voltage generators and uh, yeah, 10 times more complex than this one. but. That that's unfortunately never going to happen. Uh, so this is what we get. Yeah. At least until somebody else is crazy enough to decide they really need a tester. And there are a couple of people that have that I've become aware of that uh, are thinking about it. I guess would be the right way to say it, since none of them have anything actually built yet. So <laughs> um, there's at least one other built, but it's not 
It's not been shared and it's not really in production. So. Uh, which one is that? That's uh, out of Germany, Thomas, whatever his name is. Oh. Uh, did, you didn't meet him. All right. Um, didn't take much. You've rung us dry. It's lunchtime. So, uh, questions, comments, volunteers? <laughs> Who would like to write test vectors? <laughs> Don't all jump up. Yeah. I know oh. the city kind of petered out on that fairly fast. Um, yeah, the other thing we should mention is Mike Thompson at Rhode Island Computer Museum has been working on the tester as well and trying to develop a GUI interface for it. Um, but what's happened, and, and the reason the Pi works so nicely, is Mike's machine requires a USB interface. And that's just a whole different world because you have no control. Buffering is, is killing us. So stuff goes in, and sometime later it comes out. Yeah. You know, so you really, it becomes very random and very, very slow. Uh, but Warren's interface is great. It's really pretty sweet. Come look at it. Um, come write test vectors. Uh, come back next year. Uh, yeah, I, I sat down and built one of Vince's kits in, um, I don't know, about four hours. And, and then uh, we plugged in and it worked. Yeah. <laughs> First time. They, they generally do. Murphy had no control over us that day. Okay, um, again, last, last call, questions, comments? Yeah, I feel I need to do my due diligence here, and this is tangentially PPA related in that, uh, well, the PPA killer, the Nova, is turning 50, yep. and uh, uh, Nova Palooza is happening actually in about a month. It's hard for the short notice. Um, in, in Denver, Colorado, you can go to Nova's at 50.org. It's run by Bruce Ray at Wild Hair. And um, uh, Captain Eddie may actually be there. So, you know, if you want to meet the man, uh, he may be there. Who knows? You know, he sees a bit of a recluse, uh, but I think Bruce has been in contact with him. But uh, yeah, it is the 50 year of the, of the PPA killer, which, well, didn't really kill it, but was a thorn in its side for a while. Which, and it's really, you know, it's a continuation. Ed is Ed. Right. So he just went somewhere else where they built stuff cheap. Right. Um, took a better idea and built it more, more or less well. Right. Uh, <laughs> so. Okay. Um, yeah. And Colorado should be nice that time of year. So, well, again, thanks a lot for having the patience, almost all of you, to put up with us. Um, and we'll do it again. So thank you. And thank you guys in the back, the production staff.